Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Hello and welcome to our Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. I'm Andrew Womack and I have Julianne Harris here with us. Yes. She is a blessing <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> We've yes. been having a great time before the Bible study started. And anyway, tonight I've got some things I want to share with you that I think will really bless you. This is something that I actually wrote a little book about this just yesterday. And um, so anyway, I, I'm going to share this with you out of the book of Deuteronomy tonight. I believe it'll be really, really good. Amen. So we want you to be a part of this. And Julianne's going to share with you how you can interact, ask questions. We've also got meetings coming up and we yes. do a giveaway. Yes, we do. Every week. So yes, we do. I'm going to let Julianne share with you about yes. that. Yes. So on Tuesday nights, you guys, you can sign up for the Bible study notes. It's something that is really special about Tuesday nights. So how you're going to do that is you're going to go to awmi.net slash study. You're going to enter in your details. And when you do that, you will receive tonight's Bible study notes next week, Monday morning. So that's really awesome. And then the first time that you do that, you are entered into a drawing for a free product. So last week we gave away uh, the place of his presence by Daniel Amstutz. And the winner of that was Jeff Wall. So Jeff, uh, the team will be contacting you and getting you that book. And then tonight, what you are entered into win when you uh, sign up for the Bible study notes is the effects of praise. That's one of my book. favorite teachings. Have you read that one? I've listened to it because I'm a listener. Yep. So yeah, it's it, it well, shows. She never learned to read. She didn't get that far. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Shh. <laughs> okay, so anyways, um, so sign up for the Bible study notes and you'll be entered in to win uh, this product. Also, yes, we do have events coming up, but let me talk about first, we want you to interact with us, so that's why we do these live. So in order for you to interact with us, we want you to go down to the chat section of whatever forum you're watching, type in your questions as they come to your heart, and then we are going to answer as many of your questions as we, well, when I say we, I mean Andrew's going to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can towards the last 10 to 15 minutes of the program. In order for you to tune in while we're live and interact with us, let me go over the schedule as well if you're new tuning in. So like I say, it's five days a week. On Mondays and Fridays, we have it at 10 a.m. Tuesdays and Thursdays is at 6 p.m. And Wednesday morning is at 7 a.m. And that is all mountain time. So please tune in while we're live. Calculate that out wherever you are and tune in while we're live. Now let's talk about some upcoming events. We have an an amazing uh, lineup of upcoming events. So the first one is going to be Orlando GTC. Andrew loves going south in the winter and I am blessed because of it. Amen. <laughs> so that is going to be February 9th through the 11th. Uh, you will be ministering with Ashley and Carly Terradez, which is a supernatural uh, healing testimony, healing journey of their daughter, Hannah. So they're a, a huge blessing and products of Karis Bible College as well. I just did an interview, Ray Radio interview in Lubbock, Texas yesterday with a doctor who was a medical doctor and the thing that broke him open and let him start understanding divine healing was Hannah Terde's testimony. Wow. He said that just, he was very familiar with that sickness and he said that is impossible and that wow. turned him on to the Lord. Amen. So it was really good. Yeah, and if you want to check that out, um, I'm not sure the exact destination, but I know if you go to awmi.net um, slash stories, I believe is what it's under, you will find the healing journeys and it's actually under Hannah Terades. So I would encourage you, it would strengthen your faith because uh, God can do the supernatural. So that's Orlando. Then following that, we're going to have Men's Advance, which is March 9th through the 11th. Uh, we'll have Andrew, Billy Epperhart, Tony Dungy. It's a great men's conference, so it's men only. Uh, and Jeremy so Pearson's uh, accepted today to speak. Oh, praise God. Jeremy so is amazing. So that We normally have JB with yes. us. Yes. But he was unable to come this year because CBS is thinking of firing him because of his association with me. I was wondering, because you were talking, okay. Yeah, and wow. so he's fighting it, but he's working through the channels and he's yeah. just not got it resolved. And so, I mean, I don't know that that's what they would do, but they certainly don't like his association with me. So they're putting pressure on him to disassociate himself. So wow. anyway, we're well, dealing with all of that. Well, praise God. It costs people to be my friend. You got to watch what you do. Hey, I'm okay with that. All right. Okay. <laughs> it cost me my pride to be your friend. <laughs> 
Because <laughs> he picks on me, that's why. Okay, anyway, so that's Men's Advance. The next one is going to be Campus Days. And this is uh, going to be the best Campus Days we've had to date. And so that is going to be March 15th through the 17th. Please, if you want more information, go to awmi.net slash events and check out all the upcoming event events that we have because we have a lot of them. Those are just three that I mentioned. Also, we have prayer ministers available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you are going through anything, please, please, please do not hesitate. Give them a call. They, uh, they will stand on the word of God. They are trained in their authority and they want to see supernatural things happen for you. So give them a call at 719-635-1111. And one last thing I want to mention is this ministry is doing an amazing, uh, is spreading the gospel across the entire globe. And so you can be a part of that by becoming a partner or simply just giving. So I would encourage you, if you are being blessed by this and you know thousands of other people are being blessed, you can be a part of it by going uh, to awmi.net slash give or give us a call at 719-635-1111. So those are all my announcements, sir. I hand it back to you. That's awesome. Okay. So I want to share with you tonight, I've been studying in the book of Deuteronomy and uh, I won't give you the whole background, but the book of Deuteronomy is after 38 years after they sent the spies out and the spies, you know, disheartened the entire group and they decided not to obey God. So they had already spent one year after they came out of Egypt at Mount Sinai, getting the law, getting the directions to build the tabernacle and stuff. And then after that, Moses in Numbers 13 sent them in to possess the land, the spies and the spies came back with this negative report and they rebelled at God. And so they had spent 38 years, and it says this in the second chapter, in the beginning of the second chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. So at this time, they had spent over 39 years. They were approaching that 40 years of punishment that God had prescribed in Numbers chapter 14. And the book of Deuteronomy is Moses speaking to the children of Israel and basically giving them a history lesson so that all of these new people that had been born during the 40 years in the wilderness would know the history would, and he was just reciting and going back over what God had done. And this was the last week of his life. These are his last words. So this is very important. Moses is speaking to them just the week before he walked up into the mountain and um, died. Mm -hmm. And so he's recounting all of this and he's going back through the things that the Lord had spoken to them and things that he'd done. And in the previous verses, I'm going to go down to Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24. But in the previous verses, uh, he said that it was only 11 days journey from Egypt unto the promised land. And yet it, they had spent at this time over 39 years, nearly 40 years on an 11 day journey because of their own unbelief. And he talked about how they went through the land of Esau. God would not let them deal with the, with the Edomites. He would not let them conquer the Ammonites. And he talked about all of these things. But when they came to the land of Sihon, who was king, uh, the Lord told them to go in and possess that area. And so here in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24, it says, right, this is Moses rehearsing what the Lord told him. And, and he said that the Lord told him to tell the people, rise ye up, take your journey and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thine hand Sihon, king, the Amorite king of Heshbon, uh, yeah, Heshbon and his land, begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. And you know, as I was reading this yesterday, I just really got inspired that this is basically like six steps to victory right here in this one verse. And so I just want to share these things with you and apply it to our situation and tell you how you can win over whoever your enemy is, whether it's a person or whether it's a sickness or poverty or depression or anything you're fighting. Amen. So the very first thing he says, rise ye up. And that may sound insignificant, but you got to remember that these people, especially uh, all of those that were born during the 40 years in the wilderness, they had just been going in circles. They had just been in a holding pattern their entire life. And even the ones that were older, you know, everybody 20 year old, uh, the men that were able to fight from 20 years old and older, they all died. The only ones that were left were Moses. He died within this week of him saying this. 
and then Joshua and Caleb. Those were the only three men that were still alive who were alive when they came out of the land of Egypt. Now, there were some women and children that were, say, 15 to 19 years old. They were still alive. But everybody else in this multitude of people, millions of people, they had been born during the 40 years in the wilderness, and all they'd been doing it was just marching around in the wilderness doing nothing. There, there was nothing for them to do. They, they didn't have uh, a plan for their life. They were just marking time. So to say when the Lord says, it's time for you to rise up, that's really significant because these people had never had a goal. They never had had any ambition to do anything. They had basically been just sitting in the wilderness for 40 years waiting on a time that God would release them to go and uh, fulfill their destiny. And you know, there's, uh, there's a comparison here. There are some people watching this tonight that I, for whatever reason, your life is just in a holding, holding pattern. Mm -hmm. There's some of you that just get up, go to work, come home, watch television, go to bed, get up, go to work, and you repeat it, and your life is just, it's like you're on a treadmill. You're putting forth all of this energy, but you aren't getting anywhere. And if you aren't careful, you can get to where that becomes normal. God didn't make any of us to live a mediocre life. Amen. God made every single one of us to be able to accomplish something significant. Now, you have to define that. That doesn't mean that God wants everybody to be known worldwide. He may not want, you know, very many people to be on television or behind a pulpit. But your life is supposed to be making a contribution. You are supposed to be using the talents and the breath that God has given you to accomplish something. And yet there's so many people that your whole life is just treading water. All you're trying to do is keep your nose above water. You haven't really got anywhere to go. You aren't doing anything. Mm. I'm not saying this to condemn anybody, but sometimes you got to terrify people before you edify them. Sometimes you got to shake them and let them know that, hey, this is not the way that God intended it to be. So this is significant. He said, tell the people to rise up. In other words, it was time for them to put on their swords. It was time for them to begin to step out of what they had been doing for 40 years and get up and do something. This reminds me of those four lepers that were at the um, gate of Samaria. I think it was in um, 2 Kings chapter 5 or chapter 4, chapter 5, if I'm not mistaken. And anyway, they were in a famine. They were surrounded by the Syrians. And finally, these four lepers said, what are we going to do? If we sit here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're going to die because they don't have any food. If we go out to the Syrians, they could kill us but it's possible they might have mercy on us. And rather than sit there, they said, are we going to sit here until we die? Amen. They, they decided it was better to do something rather than nothing. They got up and when they went out to the Syrian camp, the Lord had made the Syrians hear a sound of an army coming and it so terrified them that they left. They left their food still cooking. They left all of their clothes. They left all of their silver and gold. They left their horses tied. They were running and all the way from their camp across the Jordan River. They were in such a hurry that they were throwing off their coats and there was clothes and things strewn along the way. And when those lepers went out, instead of them starving or being put to death, they had such abundance. They ate until they couldn't eat anymore. They took all of this gold raiment. They buried a lot of it. And finally, they said, we're going to go back and tell the people in the city of Samaria what happened. And they went from being zeros, they were outcast, having to live outside the city, to being heroes. <laughs> All because they said, we're going to do something, lest we do nothing. I tell you, this, this is so important that most people are afraid to step out because they're afraid that they'll fail. And yet the greatest failure that you can ever experience is to do nothing. Mm. I would rather, I like being out on a limb. To me, it just causes my adrenaline to flow. <laughs> I like being swaying in the breeze instead of hugging the trunk for security. <laughs> it's out on a limb where the fruit grows. And I tell you, this is just one of the things that has been so important in my life is not to be afraid to risk something, Amen. but get up, rise up. That was the first thing. And then he says, take your journey. 
I could spend, I'm going to have to speed up. I'm not going to cover this if I don't. <laughs> but it says, take your journey. Don't take somebody else's journey. Mm -hmm. In other words, God has prescribed a specific journey for every one of us. You know, Julianne and I were talking before the thing tonight, and she's uh, uh, in our recruiting things for Karis. And man, it's just awesome. We won't give the figures because we aren't sure, but it could be as much as three times many people already signed up for the 20 three school year as what we're signed up for the fall 22 school year. And she, she's just doing a wonderful job and God's using her. And I told her, I said, you getting those people to come to school is every bit as important as the instructors who are teaching them. Sometimes we look at the people behind the pulpit and think, look at the lives you're touching. But you know what? If Julianne and her teams weren't able to get the people in the seats, well, then it wouldn't matter what they're saying. So what she's doing is important. That's her journey right now. She may be led to do something later on, but this is what God's got her doing and it's working and it's producing. God's got me on a different journey. God has you on a different journey. You can't just pattern your life after me or after Julianne or anybody else. God's got a specific journey for you. So these are two absolutely vital steps to you seeing victory in your life, you got to get up off your duff and do something. <laughs> you got to rise up and then you got to take your journey. You got to find out what God called you to do. It's not good for you to say, God, this is what I want to do and I'm asking you to bless it. No, God, equip me and give me the ability. No, you need to find out what He called you to do. And Mike and Carrie Pickett who run our Karis Bible College, this is one of their statements that I heard them say that I love. He, they said, his will, his bill. Amen. That's really good. When you find out what God called you to do, then God will finance it. But he's not going to finance your, your decision. And this is where so many people are missing it. They may have a vision, but is it God's vision? Or is this something you came up with after eat, eating pizza? Is it a pizza vision or is it just what your family wanted you to do or is it just you are letting fate direct you? You need to rise up, quit being uh, lazy, get up, take your journey and pass over the river Arnon. The river Arnon was the border of Sihon's kingdom. Now, as long as they were going around it, they were safe. But the moment they passed over the river Arnon, they moved into enemy territory. This was committal. This, you know, there's some people that will rise up and say, all right, God, I want to do something. And they may even have an indication about what God wants them to do, but they're afraid to put themselves in the enemy crosshairs. Mm -hmm. You know, without me going into a lot of explanation, just like I was sharing about some of my friends who I love and they love me and yet it's costing them. They're, they're facing uh, criticism and rebuke and shaming over being associated with me. And uh, you know what? When you start standing and speaking out and saying what God says, it's not going to be popular. And there's a lot of ministers that won't stand up and speak the truth because they're afraid to enter across the river Arnon. They're afraid to go into enemy territory. Mm. I heard a, a, a speaker this last week on TV. I won't mention who their name, what their name is. But anyway, they said, we're going to speak against this woke culture. And I thought, man, praise God. And they did. And because I knew what was in their heart, they were speaking out against it, but they did it in such generalities mm. that nobody's going to criticize them. Mm. Nobody's going to stand anything. I'm telling you, you got to do more than that. You got to do more than just saying, you know, I don't like the way this nation is going. We need to pray for it to turn around. We need to stand up and speak the truth <laughs> and counter things and ex expose things. Amen. You know, Satan and sin, they're like a fungus or something. If it's in the dark, it'll grow. But the moment you expose it to light, it'll kill that thing. And if we stand up and start being the salt and the light that God commanded us to be, I guarantee you, it will kill this wokeness. And Amen. where I just read about a woman who's an educator uh, saying that they are putting uh, feminine products in all of the men's restrooms. And she made this statement exactly because not all people <laughs> that ministrate are women. I lie not. This woman <laughs> said that. 
how dumb can you get and still breathe? And you know what? If I stand up and say something like this, there's going to be people that'll criticize me. I just crossed over the River Arnon. I just took a step in the enemy territory. And there's a lot of people that they rise up, they want to do something, they may know what God wants them to do, but they're unwilling to expose themselves to the enemy. They want to stay over on the neutral side. I tell you, you can't do that. So these are three things. You have to rise up. You have to take your journey. Do what God tells you to do. You have to cross over in the enemy territory and put yourself in a position where there's no retreat. Hmm. Did you know I was reading about, I think it was Cortez, I'm not sure, but it was one of the Spanish explorers down in Mexico. And when he landed, he burnt all of his uh, ships so that his men could not retreat. Wow. That's the attitude that you've got to have. You've got to get to a place that there is no retreat. If there is any quit in you, you will quit. Hmm. You got to cross over into that enemy territory. Also during the Civil War, I, it was one of the uh, Southern generals, probably Lee. I, and again, I, I don't have this in front of me, but the point I'm making is right, regardless of whether it was Lee or Jackson or one of the others. But anyway, they made their people cross over a river and, it, and engage the enemy and their back was to the river and they couldn't just cross that quickly. What it meant was they were committed. You had to stand and fight because your avenue of retreat was cut off and they did it on purpose. That's the attitude that you've got to have is you've got to cross that river and enter into enemy territory and not have any quit in you. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing here, here he says, Behold, I have given unto thee, uh, unto thine hand, sound. First of all, it says, Behold. Mm -hmm. That means he told Moses to look. I have, not I'm going to, but I have given Sihon into your hand. And he told him to look and to see it. This is another thing you've got to do to see victory. You've got to see victory on the inside before you see it on the outside. You can't just rise up, take your journey, enter over into combat, engage the enemy, and hope that it's going to work. You've got to see that this is going to work. You know, I could relate this to so many things, but all of the buildings that we were doing, we've already built $130 million worth of buildings and property in nine years debt free. That's on top of everything else that I have to spend. I saw all of that. And now the Lord has told me to expand and to build dormitories, student activity center, an athletic center, a hotel conference center, a performing arts center. We're going to turn this into a regular, like a university without having all of the academic corruption and restrictions that uh, that puts on you. But we're going to have all of the facilities. And uh, to do that, I have engaged and I can see it. I see this. Some people think, do you think God's going to do this? You know, I was talking about James Brown earlier and James Brown was here looking at all of the facilities that we had. And he said, did you ever see this happening? <laughs> and, and he thought, of course, the answer would be, no, it was bigger than I said. Of course I did, JB. It wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have seen it. And immediately he realized what he had said. And I was just joking with him. But it's true. I saw all of this and I've seen all of the rest of it. This is what he told Moses. You have to see. You not only have to rise up, recognize what God wants you to do, take your journey, go over, start engaging the enemy, but you have to see yourself winning. When it comes to like fighting sickness, you have to see yourself healed before you see yourself healed. I don't know if you got that. I'm not going to take time to explain it, but you have to see yourself healed on the inside before you see yourself healed on the outside. So he told him to behold something that hadn't happened yet. This is walking by faith. Second Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Sad to say, most Christians walk by sight and not by faith. Mm. But if you are going to overcome, if you're going to really walk in victory, you have to get to where you see victory before you see the victory. And then he says, behold, I have given. Notice that it's in the past tense. This is the fifth, fifth thing here, that you have to recognize God has already made you a winner. 
You've already got healing on the inside of you. You don't need to get healed. You need to release what you already have. You have already been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. You don't need to get God to bless you. He's already blessed the work of your hands. You just need to set your hand unto something. You need to believe. You need to start, instead of quit, instead of thinking that, oh God, you can do anything. Would you give me healing? Would you give me prosperity? Would you do this? You need to see that I'm already the blessed of the Lord. By His stripes, I was healed. You have to see that He has already done it. God said, I have given into thy hand Sihon, the Amorite king. He had already done it. And yet, if you looked at it in the natural, Sihon wasn't captured yet. He wasn't conquered yet. The battle hadn't even been engaged yet. And yet He says, I have done it. It's the same with us. By His stripes, we were healed. We're already blessed. We have all of God's blessings towards us, and you need to see that. You need to see that it is already done. And then the next thing, it says, begin to possess it. So here's another thing. You have to begin, and this shows that it doesn't happen all at once. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to take the time to turn over, but in Deuteronomy chapter 7, and there's another place, I forget exactly where that is right now, but the Lord told them, He says, I'm not going to give you the land all at once. You're going to possess it little by little by little. And he said, the reason I'm doing this is because if I just drove, say for instance, he just sent some plague or somehow or another just destroyed all of the people in the promised land. And if the Israelites just had it turned over to them, it, he said that the thorns would grow. Well, they'd take over the crops. They'd take over the fields. The houses would fall apart. You aren't able to possess the land all at once. He says, I'm going to give it to you little by little. So, as you're able to possess it. And the same thing is true of us. He said, begin to possess it. That shows that there is a progression here. And so you have to begin to start following the Lord, rise up, find your journey, and um, cross over into the enemy territory. See in your heart that everything has already been done and given unto you. And then you have to recognize there is a progression as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, about don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, that shows a progression. The same thing is said in Mark chapter 4, verse 28, where it says, For the seed brings forth fruit of herself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full corn in the ear. Both of those scriptures are showing that there are steps and stages this is one of the reasons that people fail is because they get stirred up. They rise up. They recognize what God told them to do. They're willing to go fight. They engage. They start doing these things, but they think it's just going to be over in nothing flat, that they're going to obtain these things. Mm. You know, people come here and see what God has done in my life. And I know that there's people that have done much more than what's happened to me, but I guarantee you where I came from, where I was stone broken, would go weeks without eating to now where we see over a hundred million a year come in and we have facilities and we're seeing people's lives change. It's miraculous. It's not me. It's God who's done it. And people come and see what God has done in my life and they just think, all right, I'm going to do that. And they get up and they expect within the next six months to see in their life what God has done in my life in 55 years. They don't recognize that there is a progression. You have to begin to possess it. And then the last thing it says, and contend with him in battle. So you have to rise up. You have to take your journey. You have to cross over into enemy territory. You have to see in your heart that everything is already done. You have to recognize that it's a progression, but then you have to engage. You have to contend. You have to fight. Mm. And there's a lot of people that are willing to stir themselves up, speak, confess, do all of these things. They want to see themselves and uh, accomplishing all this. They're willing to do all of those things, but they aren't willing to engage the enemy. You have to contend. God did not drive them out. Did you know God could have driven them out in some way that they wouldn't have even had to have lift up a sword? But that's not the way He did it. Amen. They had to go in and fight. And you are going to have to stand and you're going to have to fight. And war gets messy. And so anyway, here, I, these are seven things, if I'm not mistaken, that you do. And 
if you would apply all of these things in this one verse to what he told the Israelites about how they were going to conquer their uh, enemies, the same thing would apply for you. And I tell you, I can relate to every single one of these things. And if you, it works for me, it'll work for you. And so I encourage you to get that and be looking for this little booklet that I wrote yesterday. It's really good. I think you'll be blessed by it. Oh, I'm superbly blessed. And as I'm listening to it, it's like a mixture of about five different teachings. Oh yeah, I got a lot of, I ma major on each one of these. Yeah, each one of them is a whole teaching. Yeah. So um, is it okay if I list some that I was writing down as you were teaching? Yes, that's fine. Because this would be good for you to call the prayer center too. The booklet's gonna be off the hook, but if you wanna full delve into, cause there's a lot of questions coming in about purpose and about all of these different things. So power of the imagination yep. would be one of the teachings. How to find, follow and fulfill God's mm -hmm. will for your life covers a few of those things. Also, you've already got it. Yeah. Uh, you've already got the victory. And then also like the authority of the believer as well mm -hmm. of possessing it. You got to so, stand up and fight. Yeah. So any of those um, subject matter would help you in these, in these topics. So let's get into the questions. Okay. Um, okay. So first question, Lydia on YouTube says, I've been asking God to give me out of this holding pattern and what my spiritual gifts, what are my spiritual gifts? She says, I find myself asking in my sleep, do you have any points, pointers to help me get out of this wilderness? Well, I, I would say, how do you stir yourself up? Mm. And you could turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 30, where David had had his city invaded, his wife and children were taken captive, all of his armies, they lost all of their families. And it was such a bad situation, their homes had been burned and all of the people spoke of stoning David. <laughs> it would have been a great opportunity to be depressed. But it says, David encouraged himself in the Lord is God. And the way he did it, he called for an ephod, which was a way of inquiring from God. So what it would apply to us is he turned to the word of God. And this is what I do. Like just yesterday, I was, I've, I've finished reading through the Bible in one year at the first of January. And I was just saying, God, I want to go to something that'll stir me up. And the book of Deuteronomy really does that for me. And that's how I came to all of this. So you go to the Word of God and you read about how God used other people and recognize Romans chapter 2, verse 11, He's no respecter of persons. And you use the Word to stir you up. Another thing I do, I spend lots of time praying in tongues. I'll pray in tongues hours at a time because the Bible says when you pray in tongues, you build yourself up on your most holy faith. Jude chapter 1, verse 20, it, on and on you could go. It says 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2, that you edify yourself, which means to promote spiritual growth. So if you're praying in tongues, not just for one phrase, one syllable, just to give you a goosebump, but if you pray in tongues over a prolonged period of time, I guarantee you it will build you up on your most holy faith. Amen. So Lydia, those are two things you can do is get into the Word of God, read what God has done for other people, pray in tongues and say, God, show me what you want me to do. And I guarantee you, you do that over a period of time, you will get stirred up. Amen. Praise God, that's great. Uh, Denard on YouTube says, Andrew, I've heard you talk about holy dissatisfaction. How can we know if a major dissatisfaction over something, let's say your job, is really a nudge from God or just carnality? Well, that's a really good question because it is possible that you can be dissatisfied not because it's God stirring you up. It's just because you aren't seeking God. You've got your attention on something else. You're, if you're looking at depressing, discouraging things, you're going to be depressed and <laughs> discouraged. <laughs> and so what I would do, it says that the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him, Isaiah 26, 3. So I would make sure my mind is stayed on the Lord. Then I'd use Psalms chapter 37, verse 4, which says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That doesn't mean that he will put, he will supply anything you want. It means he will put his desires in your heart. So I would make sure that my mind is stayed upon God. And sometimes I actually will fast and just take a day off doing nothing but fasting and praying and refocus all of my attention on God. So I'm sure that my uh, focus is on the Lord and I'm delighting myself in the Lord. And if I do those things, I guarantee you, if I have carnal dissatisfaction, it'll leave and I'll get a whole new perspective and I'll start having the peace of God rule in my life. But if I'm in, doing something that I shouldn't be doing, 
my dislike, my dissatisfaction will intensify. And if I'm seeking the Lord with my whole heart and delighting myself in the Lord, and if I have less peace when I do that about the job I'm in or what I'm doing, I take that as being God telling me that you aren't doing the right thing. Because uh, it says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15, let the peace of God rule in your heart, umpire in your heart is what that word literally means. And so you delight yourself in the Lord, make sure that He's got your, your desires are His desires, you're putting your mind upon the Lord, and then you just let peace rule you. And if you know that you're seeking God with your whole heart and you still don't feel peace about something, quit doing it. Get out of it. Yeah, that's powerful. That's the way you do it. And uh, I was just thinking, I heard a message from Billy Epperhart, um, and he was talking about you. And he was talking about how once you have determined you've heard the voice of God, then you automatically move from a place of faith, of knowing, you know, that faith moment of this is God's voice, immediately into trust. He says he's never seen anybody else do it to where you just move into trust that God said it, he's going to make it happen. You know, Billy Epperhart's another example of what we're talking about because he, he became a multimillionaire. He had attained all of his goals and he was laying on his couch and he was miserable yeah. because he still had all, even though he didn't have to work, he still had all of these gifts and talents. Yeah. And finally, his wife, Becky, came in to him and says, you get up off that couch or I'm going to kill you. <laughs> And it was at that exact time that Paul Milligan, who was my CEO, called him to help him start our business school in Karis Bible College. That's where we met. And then after a number of years doing that, he's now my CEO. And I tell you what, Billy is just one great blessing from God. He is yeah. a 10 talent guy, but he was dissatisfied and it wasn't because of anything in the natural. He had everything provided but he wasn't satisfied. God had something more. And so I think sometimes we do have a holy dissatisfaction and it's God saying that it doesn't matter about whether you need the money or whether any of these things. You just need to follow what God puts in your heart. And if you don't have peace working that job, you either need to get right with God so that you can recognize this is where God put me and you bloom where you're planted or you need to get out of that job and take, rise up, take Amen. your journey. Amen. And Cross the river. So this leads into the next question. Uh, Shakia S. on YouTube says, what if God has called you to do something? So like you're talking about, we know that God's calling us to something. Yet there are so many hindrances around that you feel lost and don't really know the direction you should go. What is the best thing to do then? Well, first of all, you need to not think that if you know what God wants you to do, that it's just going to work automatically. <laughs> the Apostle Paul said, there is a great and an effectual door open unto me, but there are many adversaries. Amen. He saw a man in Macedonia saying, come over here and help us. He had a vision and he knew it was God that sent him into Macedonia. But within 48 hours of being there, he was beaten and in the prison with his feet and hands in the stocks. So this concept that if God just tells me to do something, everything should work out. I don't think you should use circumstances to confirm or dissuade you from doing what God says. But if you were to go by circumstances, it's probably more biblical to say that if everything is against you, you're probably in the will of God. <laughs> God. It's, it's just the opposite. If you don't face any opposition, it's because you and the devil are going in the same direction. You turn around and start swimming upstream, there's going to be mm -hmm. opposition. So first of all, it, just because there's opposition from what you think God wants you to do, that's not, a di that's not something to discredit that saying that this could be God because that may be a sign that you are in the will of God. And so you just go out and you face Goliath, just like David did. You don't run the other direction, you face it and you go headlong into it. Now you have to make sure that what you're doing is what God told you to do. You have to have that confidence and assurance. But once you get it, man, you just, you have to run at the enemy and make them retreat instead of you. So you just, it's the same thing we were talking about. You have to stir yourself up. Amen. If you don't stir yourself up, you'll sink to the bottom. Amen.
So uh, Samaya on YouTube has a great question. She says, Second Corinthians says, it's God who leads us to victory always. So how much of our victory is dependent on us and how much of our victory is dependent upon God? It's 100% dependent upon God and 100% dependent upon you. It's like marriage. <laughs> it's not 50-50 or something else. Like for instance, I was ministering in school today and out of uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 26, that the uh, Holy Spirit helps our infirmities for we know not how to pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. And then it says in the next verse, and uh, the, he that knows, he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And if you go into the Greek words, there is actually four Greek words put together to make one. Four compound words and it literally means that the Holy Spirit takes hold together with us when we intercede. So it's not us interceding and God answers our intercession. It's not the Holy Spirit interceding for us without us. If He was interceding for us automatically without us, our lives would be perfect because He's the perfect intercessor. So it's not us doing it. It's not the Holy Spirit doing it. It's a combination of those two. The Holy Spirit takes hold together with us. And it's the same thing when uh, Samiah asked this question, how much is us and how much is God? Well, it's 100% God, but He only flows through you. So if you allow yourself to get into fear, to become complacent, to be dormant, you can limit God. Mm -hmm. So it is you. Did you know everything that we've done here? I don't know how to say, I'm not saying these things in a bragging way. I'm just trying to illustrate. But everything that we've seen God do in Karis Bible College, Andrew Womack Ministries, it wouldn't have happened without me. But I can guarantee you it wasn't me that did it. It was God that did it, but He did it through me. I would pray and seek the Lord and God would speak to me and show me what to do. But then I had to take steps of faith. I had to speak. I had to fight against things and do things. And so it was God. It was 100% God, but it wouldn't have happened without me. So it was also me. And it's a combination of those two. And most people can't seem to put those things together. They either say, well, God, we are nothing. We have nothing. We can do nothing. So we're just asking you to do it. And then they goof off. If you do that, God's not going to do it because He has to flow through us. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, Now unto Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Most people just put a period there and say, God's able to do exceeding abundantly above anything we ask or think. That's not true. He has that power, but it won't work until there's power working in you. So God's power is limited to how much power is working in you. It's not your power. It's His power, but it's in you. It's at your disposal. And if you don't stir yourself and build yourself up on faith, God's not going to do it without you. And so many people miss this. They just ask God, to go touch this person and heal them. God's not going to heal them without some person being involved. And I know many of you can think, well, that's not true. There's people that just sovereignly heal. It's not so. I, if I had time, I could defend that. But God flows through people. It says in Romans chapter 10, how can they believe if they never hear? How can they hear without a preacher? How can they preach unless they're sent? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. It's the Word of God that produces victory in every one of these areas, but that Word is, has to be spoken through people. God is not going to speak and use angels to proclaim the gospel. He gave that authority to mankind. And so it's, it's all God flowing through you. And there has to be the combination of those two. Man, that's powerful. So we got time. Let's take one more. You want question. one more? Okay. Um, Alicia on YouTube says, if you're struggling with fear and anxiety and what deliverance, do you have to have someone who knows how to work in deliverance help you? You can have somebody help you with deliverance, but even if they were able to deliver you from anxiety and fear, there's a reason why you're that way. And if you don't change Amen. the root of the problem, they cut it off at ground level. It'll just grow back. <laughs> 
So sometimes if you have literally gone so far into something that you've got demonic problems and it's demonic oppression and stuff, you may need somebody to help you, but there is nothing that any person can do for you that the Word of God wouldn't set you free Amen. if you just got into the Word. And so uh, you could get into the Word. Plus Jesus said that if you cast the devil out of a person, that he goes around seeking someplace else. And if he can't find someplace, he'll take back seven spirits more worse than himself and enter in. And your last state will be worse than the first. So if a person just casts things out of you without you getting established in the Word, I can guarantee you Satan is going to try and come back and reestablish his domain on the inside of you. And if you didn't have the Word of God instilled in you, you're going to wind up worse off. So the best way, it's not the only way, but the best way is to just get into the Word of God and the Word of God will literally set you free. Mm -hmm. John chapter 8, verse 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Amen. That's what I experienced through Karis Bible College because Karis, uh, our only textbook is the Bible. That's right. And it's the Word that will change you and it's everlasting. It's lasting change. It's not trying to white knuckle it. It's and if we, if somebody would have just got in and tried to force you to submit to them and you're doing things for them and stuff, it might have benefited you to a degree, but it would, you would have come back and yeah. you get on your own and Satan would have reestablished his beachhead yeah. in your life. But because you did it through the Word, you're free. That's it. That's it. That's awesome. It is awesome. Praise God. That's a good Bible study. Oh, it was so I good. I can't, help people. I want to go watch it again because that's powerful. It's well, amazing. You need it. You you need to watch it two or three times. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. We all need it. Amen. amen. Well, thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of this. You know, if the Lord stirred you up and if you want someone to pray with you and you say, man, amen. I need help. Uh, you can call our helpline, the number's on the screen, 719-635-1111, and they can pray with you, but they can also point you towards these uh, teachings that Julianne was talking about, and they would be a real help to you. So uh, please call that number. Let us help you any way we can, and, and join us again next week and, and the rest of this week for all of these other Karis Live Bible Studies. I tell you, I'm excited. God is going to do something special during these meetings. The conferences are great. You're going to get a chance to meet people from all over the country, all over the world. The speakers are phenomenal. You are now the righteousness of God, and you got to quit looking at yourself in the natural, and you got to see yourself in Christ. Andrew's teaching and the love that he has for God's Word and truth, it is the gospel truth. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.